Greetings, everybody, and welcome to a windfall reading for February. So glad you could come. We have a great evening of readings from a couple of fantastic authors. Uh, my name is Wendy, and I work at the Eugene Public Library. Before I introduce our liaisons for the Lane Literary Guild, Amanda and Diane, I just have a couple quick things to say, then we'll launch into the marrow of the evening. Uh, first, a couple of very heartfelt thank yous. First, to the Lane Literary Guild, of course, without which we would not be doing the Windfall Reading Series. Thank you so much for all the good work you do for authors, for readings, for um, writers around uh, not just Lane County, but beyond. So thank you so much for that. Um, thank you also to the Friends of the Eugene Public Library and the Eugene Public Library Foundation, both groups tirelessly advocate for, fundraise for, and are proponents of um, all things library related, reading related, literacy related. So thank you so much for all your hard work. Um, if you live in Eugene, we do have a book sale going on in April. It's one of those massive book sales we have every year and it'll be at the fairgrounds again. So we'll have some more information about that as the uh, readings go on tonight. But keep your eyes peeled for that. It's always a fantastic event, and there are so many different kinds of books that you can choose from, all at low, low prices, and they all help the library. Um, so thank you for that. So thanks to all of those groups so much. Um, tonight, after the readings, we will have a great uh, bit of time for some questions and answers of the authors as well as some comments you might have or I, um, thoughts you wanna share. Uh, you can do those a couple of different ways. One, you're welcome to make a comment right below this video in the YouTube comment box, and we will read that after. Uh, or if you want to email me, you are welcome to do that too. Let me get my email up. It'll also be below this reading, so you won't have to feel um, like you have to memorize this or anything. Uh, there it is. So there's my email address. You are more than welcome and encouraged to send an email to me and I will read it at the end. You can use your name. You can use a fancy pseudonym. Just go for it, whatever you want to do. So please do ask questions or comments. Um, that's what this is for. It's a bit of give and take, even though it's a live stream. So uh, thank you for that. And on that note, I would like to bring uh, Diane and Amanda to the fore so they can introduce our authors. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Writer, editor, and lecturer Shannon Applegate is the author of Skookum, an Oregon pioneer family's history and lore which was an Oregon Book Award finalist and has been named one of Oregon's 100 best books. And the memoir, Living Among Headstones, Life in a Country Cemetery. Recipient of an Oregon Governor's Arts Award, she is known for her research into regional history. A direct descendant of one of Oregon's earliest pioneer families, she serves as site director of Applegate House Heritage Arts and Education in Yonkala, where she lives. Shannon reads tonight from Final Revisions of Minus Tides, a gripping novel of environmental disruption and political turmoil on the coast and in the forests of Oregon. I have read sections and its characters and historical multicultural sweep now go with me everywhere. I can't wait to hold it between covers. Shannon. The very front of the book, um, about two of the principal characters, Alice Hunter, an environmentalist and artist, and Estelle Overstreet, a native woman who is coming back 
to her home on the coast. This is set around Marshfield at that time. I've changed the names of places, but I think some of you will recognize that this is very much about the South Coast, particularly around Charleston and North Bend, and also up the coast um, to Astoria. So I'll begin. The two women approach the tree, following the fading sign that reads, Words, world's largest Sitka spruce. The younger woman who represents a conservation group introduced the idea, a stop to stretch legs, a visual novelty for the elderly native woman she's driving down the coast from the airport. It is almost two o'clock in the afternoon. But the thickets of young Douglas fir lining the path on either side make a shady corridor with only diffused light sifting through. The air is cool, still, and moist enough to form a fine penetrant mist, the ocean's breath blowing across the nearby highway. The older woman pauses along the gravel path leading to the giant tree, adjusting the belt of her deer colored suede coat. As her companion watches, she shivers slightly, pulling the coat more snugly around herself. There is no summer in this grove. This detour, is it such a good idea? The younger woman who's not yet 30 asks herself. Soon they reach the edge of the small clearing where a large metal sign appears that is riven with rifle shot so that the lettering is both rusted and pocked. A corporation logo appears at the top. The side reads, here stands the world's largest remaining Sitka spruce, 310 feet high and 15 feet in diameter. In this 800 year old tree is enough wood to build seven two bedroom houses. Spruce was once used to build aircraft for the Allied forces in World War I. About a mile from here was located one of 13 U.S. Army's Spruce Division installations, which dotted the Pacific coast from Washington's Olympic Peninsula to Simpsons Bay, Oregon. This magnificent spruce, the last of its kind, has been saved, and this park wayside provided as an ongoing community service of the Timber Corporation as name. How kind, Alice Hunter murmurs acidly. How very kind of the corporation. Then a nursery lyric comes to mind that she knows she is skewing somehow. The tree stands alone, the tree stands alone, the ground is strewn with wads of candy wrappers, crumpled beer cans, glinting scraps of foil, and ground in cigarette butts with virtually indestructible filters, the filaments inside escaping, discolored by nicotine and weather, and not a single trash receptacle in sight. But she's seen this all before. Who has not? And once, in this very spot, she's carefully picked up each bit of flotsam and jetsam lost by a two-footed tide. Despite everything, the ancient spruce is miraculously present, yet how much longer can it stand, she wonders. What will it, when will it be brought down, and what will bring it down? The hand of God? More likely machines in hand. She's calling on a venerable friend, she feels, paying her respects, carefully quiet, slowly, slowly, a processional walk with no offering except herself. She in front, the older woman following, the tree gradually coming closer until it looms before them, an immense rough-sided tower sheathed in silvery bark. It is a thing so huge that the eye cannot hold it. Unlike a mountain rising on a plain, its shape is impossible to grasp in a single glass, glance, especially in such stippled, concealing light. 
Encircling the mighty trunk is an astonishing network of contorted roots, but even these are hard to see because of a dense young forest allowed to grow around the perimeter, which further obscures the tree's massive outline. Even so, there isn't going to be a better vantage point, and so she stops in a spot of sunlight streaming through the deep shadows. The older woman arrives beside her now, expecting some response. Alice looks at Mrs. Overstreet. Some outward sign of awe, a sigh, but her older companion is silent, her head tipped back, the coronet of braids still mostly black and visibly pinned to the top of her head. Then Alice sees her tucking the silk scarf into her coat collar. She folds her arms. Is she chilled, bored? Who knows? 800 years old, Alice says. I never get it, I mean, absorb it. It's so very, very old. And then she repeats the number again, inviting a response. The older woman glances at her. My people were already here by then, she says in a matter of fact way. Long before that, I guess. But now Alice turns to her own gazing, looking up, talking to herself, or perhaps to the tree whose presence envelops her. She says quietly, almost dreamily, this is its stem, really. It reminds me of some sort of immense prehistoric flower, a flower from the age of reptiles, the Mesozoic. And she looks at the other woman again. Really, what do you think, Mrs. Overstreet? The old woman shrugs and then says, it looks like itself to me. I want to go around it, she says, and see the other side. Will you be all right? Alice asks, resisting an impulse to follow her to touch the suede sleeve of the coat. Ahead, she knows how the path becomes uneven, studded with rocks and roots. The older woman seems steady enough, but who knows? But now the tone is curt. I walk all alone at the park in Oakland where I live. I don't need a cane or you at my arm. Trying to allay a tug of anxiety, Alice nods, watching the deer-colored coat and its owner disappear from view behind the spruce. And she can't help but feel some relief being alone for a few moments after several hours in the car with the older woman making conversation is not proving to be easy and there's still an hour or more from their destination. She needs the tightness in her neck, sore from the long drive, the tension of thinking up things to say. She wishes her hooded jacket, still in the back seat, was on her shoulders. She runs her fingers through the unruliness of her hair, feeling the moist sprawl of curls brought on by damp weather. But Mrs. Overstreet, she hopes, surely has cover now beneath the spruce's sheltering arms. Alice looks up again, bracing her neck with her hand, hearing her wristwatch ticking in her ear in tiny increments of time. How many ticks, she wonders, in 800 years, incessant ticking. She hears the beating surf on the other side of the highway, imagining its froth and velocity, the way it is hurtling itself against rocks, jagged and dark at the base of the headlands. These images drown, are drowned out by the highway sounds of loaded logging trucks, the penetrating staccato of their brakes as their drivers are forced to slow down. She tries not to hear this newer world, to keep her eyes trained on the old spruce, drawing comfort from the candelabrum curves of its nearest limbs, limbs of such girth, they are themselves the circumference of good-sized trees. In shaggy symmetry, they tangle and droop, layer upon layer, up and up, finally gathering at the crown where bright spikes of light pierce through the uppermost branches. The spruce is habit, its habitat. She lives for the knowledge of such things. She knows, too, the look of its stiff bottle brush needles when she peers through her hand lens at this moment tucked in her pocket. But it is imagination, not knowledge, that calls to her now. 
capturing her artist's eye, twisted by age and wind, the highest branches contoured in a wild way that her pen or pencil can never quite follow, although she's tried many times from this spot. Suddenly she realized that her past analogies, a tower, a flower, are wrong. They do not describe this thing, this behemoth, not linked to humans or even to land. What she sees so clearly now, why hasn't she seen it before? There at the very top is an overturned octopus. Oh no, she thinks again, searching for an even better analogy. What she is seeing, what is living up there is a sky clawing squid. At the other side of the tree, panting slightly, Estelle Overstreet has perhaps gone a little too far. She feels short of breath. What a strange young woman. Questions and more questions. She was glad to be out of Alice's sight and after resting a moment, looks down at the ground again, carefully placing her feet, avoiding the vast network of exposed roots. She's not at her best, really. On the plane, she had felt dizzy, and somewhere in the middle of the flight, her eyes seemed not to focus properly, but she'd not bothered the stewardess and felt better by the time they landed. Now she's hoping to be revived by the fresh air and a chance to smoke a cigarette. She takes one from the pocket of her coat and lights it with a small lighter that her friend Wanda has given her. She watches the smoke curl upward blue and satisfying, inhaling and exhaling, glad to have some privacy, a little distance between herself and her inquisitor, not to mention the confines of the car. Closer to the tree now, she sees its trunk is fluted at the very bottom, like a vast skirt made from bark. The roots, though, intrigue her the most, poking out of the ground like giant knuckles or thick ropes, some arching four or five feet off the ground so high she thinks a child might walk beneath them, or better yet, straddle them, and give them names, Twister, Camelback, Black Lariat. She stubs out her cigarette, but picks up the remains, wadding it in cellophane she stripped from the pack, carefully placing it in her coat pocket. She supposes it's time to make her way back to the blonde woman who is more of a girl. She grips one tall arching root after another, slowly making her way, holding and releasing, enjoying the living touch of wood. How long? How long has it been since she's been truly outside? The outside of her own girlhood with trees of this kind and ferns. In the city, in the park where she and Wanda walk daily, it is nothing like this, especially now, as she allows her shoes to sink in to the soft moss, pleased with the sensation. How does spruce smell? She breathes in. The truth she seems to have come to the time in her life, perhaps because she smokes when there is little odor to anything. But she would like to once again smell red cedar, especially. She remembers the bonfires of her youth. And it comes to her now as she slowly makes her way around the roots, why she feels she recognizes this giant, this old grandfather spruce. His nephew lived on the island. It was not as tall or hefty and had a broken top, yet it too had a massive girt. It took many children holding hands to encircle it. Of course, she'd been a small person, and the smaller the person, the bigger the memory. A gift tree, someone had called it that, perhaps her uncle. It stood on the back side of the island, by which she supposes she means the island's north side, her island now, they're saying, if the strange girl is to be believed, the island she will soon stand upon again. That last time, was it 55 years ago? More than half a century? How was it possible? Did that big spruce still stand? 
where the branches dipped low and her old relatives hung heart-shaped cockles, limpets, and mussel shells. The mussels were pearly and violet blue inside, and these shells and certain songbird feathers were attached to strips of elk hide and red flannel dangling beside a few tiny funnel baskets painstakingly woven from spruce roots. Baskets so dainty they were fit for the hop on my thumbs in her grandmother's stories. As young girls, though, she and her female cousins wanted white people's playthings instead, dolls with checkered outfits or printed sewing cards with colored shoestrings to pull through the punched out places. They were disappointed by the old fashioned things, those old things they lamented. They didn't even appreciate the little patch pouches filled with choice beech agates and green chert bird points or the brass thimbles their grandmother sometimes hung so they would tinkle in the wind. Thimbles of the old fashioned sort with holes in the fingertip so a person could feel what she was doing when she worked on our deer skin dance dress. But it was the pouches that people prized most, other people that is. Where had she put the single one? Empty, of course. She'd saved only because Omashi had made it. Was it still in that skinny drawer of her traveling trunk? But now, why are her brothers here pushing at her, jumping for the old dangling things, shards of light glittering, falling back, and there are stars in the day, her face, breaking along one side as she tries to clutch a bending thing on the way down that does not hold cold, cold, moss, muck, lightning eye, flattened cheek. Mrs. Overstreet, Mrs. Overstreet, the face with its halo of frizzy pale hair is floating over her, saying what? Sisu, I want to explain the name. Sisu is not an Indian name, nor is it someone's name. As my character Maddie Prepola says in the book, you might have to be a Finn to appreciate what Sisu means. I'll put it this way. When someone knocks you down, like the Russians, or if you've made it over here to this country and become an organizer in a logging camp where some scissor bill boss or his thugs throw you out, rough you up, something awful, well, you stand back up, even if it's all happened to you before and you know you'll have to go through it again. And again, you have sisu. Sisu means you have a special kind of endurance, guts without a show of having guts. It's just a part of you your heritage. Carl, chapter 27. Carl eyes the long rickety ascent of the plank steps tucked in the shadow of the bluff, it obviously slick in places, as he rechecks the aluminum numerals that are more than slightly askew at the bottom of the stairs. He's arrived at the right place after several false starts and then an irksome shirt search for a parking spot. The three-story rectangular wooden house with its rows of uncurtained windows stands almost at the top of the bluff. Jesus Christ, he mutters, already tired of schlepping. And that is the word for it, a word rising out of the Brooklyn neighborhood where he'd been brought up. He is loaded down with a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and mics and a cord in a box, feeling a little off balance because of the satchel slung on his shoulder in which he stuffed assorted notebooks that he probably should have left in his pickup until he assessed whether they were needed or not. A drag, he mutters, as he feels the pelt of rain. There's only one landing where he can catch his breath. He pauses, coughing a little. It occurs to him he's probably smoking too much and not just lucky strikes. How does the old man manage, he wonders, as he nears the top. 
of the non too sturdy looking ramp angling off the front porch, clearly intended for a wheelchair, there must be some other access to the house which he hasn't seen. Suddenly he hears an unearthly yowl that nearly makes him drop the box. Gray and white, it leaps onto the porch, the biggest battered up Tom cat he's ever seen, pink asshole and walnut sized balls, quite evident, bristling gray tail, almost vertical and fully the circumference of a giant Coney Island hot dog. The screen door, Carl can see, is shredded and gouged. The cat, turning briefly, reveals one half shut, gummy looking green eye and then returns its attention to the doorway, batting at the screen with one long extended claw with such vengeance that Carl steps back. Afraid of a cat, a fraidy cat, Charles, he chides himself. But he really doesn't want to extend his arm above the big Tom as he knocks on the door. Instead, he calls out, Mr. Prepole, I'm here. Carl Panofsky, sir. Then louder, because the beast has commenced to yell again in competition, apparently. Hello, hello. Keep your shirt on, mister, a voice answers as the door opens, revealing the silhouette of someone in a wheelchair, backlit by a window at the end of the hallway. Step back, I'm gonna let the cat in first. Sisu don't like people who are so damned late, do you, Sisu? The man says, addressing the cat, while Carl watches as it slips supple as smoke through the barely ajar green screen door. It appears behind the old man, who now wheels himself backwards to allow Carl inside. Not off to a good start, Carl thinks, murmuring apologies that sound lame even to himself, still holding the box in his arms. The old man is clearly glowering at him under a thick, wiry ledge of eyebrows. As the wheelchair moves toward him again, the man's features grow more distinct. Carl sees that the blue eyes aren't focused upon him, are possibly not focused on anything. The old guy is blind, he realizes, feeling a wave of pity. But if the old man seems at a physical disadvantage, He's not at a psychological one. After giving an audible hound-like sniff, he said, you forgot to say that maybe you're so damn late because of a little interlude with Mary Jane. Marijuana, what's the matter with you people? You think the smell doesn't hang on your clothes? You can't be as stupid as my grandson, for God's sakes. He gives a dismissive chortle as Carl feels himself reddened. Glad that the old man can't see it. I thought you university fellows were smarter than that, at least more professional. Or maybe you're younger than I thought you'd be. Just how old are you, Professor? Carl feels a mixture of embarrassment and panic. What would Pfeiffer say about this decidedly unsmooth entry where he'd already managed to antagonize his quarry? He sees his plans to get into a doctoral program with this old man's experiences greasing the way, literally going up in smoke. He considers denying his use of pot, but something tells him he better not that this blind old geezer can see right through him. I'm 32, sir, he answers in a tone. He hopes it's dignified, adding, Mr. Prepole, but he's cut off as the old man says, not unkindly, prep, like the school you may have gone to and not ah, but ooh, the Finnish way. Then he turns his wheelchair quickly, expertly avoiding, although not by much, a high backed wooden bench against the wall. Ah, oh, come on in, who am I to be pulling on your short hairs? It's not like I never showed up someplace late, only I was drinking not getting silly on wacky tobacco or whatever you call it, pot. I call it pot. And I promise, Mr. Prepula, Carl says, pronouncing the name carefully and correctly, that I won't show up even just a little loaded again. I'm sorry. I guess it's got out of hand lately. He hopes his honesty is coming off as manly and disarming and that they will be finished with the topic. Prepula is silent for a moment 
plucking at the Pendleton lap robe across his knees. Prepola points in the direction of a comfortable looking chair, indicating that Charles should at least sit down. You can put the stuff you brought on that coffee table, but you may have to move it later. There is only one outlet on that wall. This place was built before electricity. Suddenly the cat darts across the floor, making a beeline toward the old man and with surprising lightness leaps into his lap. Carl settles himself, hearing the throaty sound of the cat's purrs, increasing with every stroke of the old man's gnarled hand. A purr, Carl thinks, that will not enhance the quality of any recording. The perpetual whoosh of cars and ringing hum of wheels on the steel bridge will pose an even larger problem. Well, what I want to talk about is serious, the old man says. It's close to the chest. He pauses as though wanting to say something exactly right. I have certain matters to divulge in a certain way, if you know what I mean. No one knows about them except me. But what I have to ask myself is, Sonny, are you the right fella? Carl is listening hard in a way that makes his ears ring. He has the feeling he is about to hear something, to begin something important, something that will tell him how to be. He feels something else too, an affinity with this old man, as if eventually he might be able to understand this imperfect stranger better than most of the people he knows. He sits absolutely still, waiting for Prepola to gather his thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. Okay, that was wonderful. So our next reader, Donna Henderson, loves artistic collaboration and cross-genre creative projects, especially those involving music. Her poems, song lyrics, essays, reviews, and artwork appear in journals, anthologies, exhibits, and recordings. She is the author of four poetry collections, two of them finalists for the Oregon Book Award. A practicing psychotherapist, Donna lives along the Deschutes River in Maupin, Oregon. Her newest book of poetry, Send Word, published in 2022 by Riparian Press, explores tensions between our wild and civil selves, between compliance and transgression, between waking and dreaming. Ultimately, her poems speak about language. Language can reignite the feeling and action of a particular moment, she has said, and music of language takes us into a place we can explore. Welcome, Donna Henderson. Thank you so much. Oh, I think I'd like to take a moment um, with all of you for us to just drop into our bodies, um, which will it always helps me when I'm um, reading poetry as when I'm writing it. Because while we may um, enter a poem by way of its meaning, that can be kind of the portal and invitation, the, maybe a story it tells or the language of description. When we're moved by a poem, it happens at the level of the body because the body is where we actually feel things literally, where we're touched in a literal sense. And the language of poetry really meets us there through our senses, through a poem's music, the cadences, um, word associations, the images it evokes, through the felt associations uh, that a poem makes, as well as what meaning or story we may find. So I just want to take a moment here now, just a second, do that myself as we connect, and hopefully you And then 
um, as a way to kind of begin in that spot, and also because it's still winter, I'm going to start with a poem from my previous collection, The Eddie Fence, um, followed by several poems from the new one, um, Send Word. And then if I haven't used up all my time, I may read an, a little bit of new work also. But I'm going to begin with a poem entitled First Ice. We wake up as the darkness begins giving way, first to an indigo glow like laundry bluing, phosphorescent and implausibly dense. Shades of trees appear, then trees, then a dreamy, scintillant stillness unfurls as light, as landscape under a spell. A fat sleekness blisters and thickens the porch. In the pasture, grass blades bow down in glass sleeves. The woods are themselves and not themselves in their subtle glister, the way a truly glamorous woman, my grandmother used to say, charm bracelets rustling, conceals every seam and trace of her artifice, leaving pure effect. Inside, a chef on TV makes aspic while we wait for the forecast. One strives for the clearest, thinnest gel, he is saying. One wants to illuminate one's terrain, not to thicken it. And as he spreads his glaze, I see the soul rise from its loaf and lay its glossy, immaterial bliss across that surface of meat and salt with its scallion fleur-de-lis, making it marvelous. As the world is today, as it was in the beginning, that last instant, water, matter, and light were one, each distinct, not yet separate. These next three poems, um, which, which come early in Send Word, will introduce the speaker in these poems, which in some of the other poems you don't really hear from directly. So the first one is entitled uh, Twain, which is um, a title that does not refer to Mark Twain, but rather to one of those words that has, as Cleave does, that double meaning of to split in two and to twin, twain. I am the watcher and walker. She is the me immersed in the world. I am slick. She is sticky. Inside, fog blooms between the double glazed panes as the cabin warms. Amber of old bourbon swirls in its flask. I measure some out. She swills. This next poem is entitled The Beginning of February, a love poem for Rich, who's sitting across from me. Now spring in its flannels starts its delicate tremble. Here, a tree full of catkins. There, a cherry's risked bursting its snug buds to bloom. This everything, you'd asked, on this day, half my life ago now, toward my pile of things poised by the door like caddis flies in an eddy fence, caught between the river's pool and swirl, the life I'd planned and the one I hadn't planned. No longer separate, my things, not yet joined. And my yes was a kind of dying, the way cells consenting to split, surrender to mystery the soul's containment. 
Outside, snow held its ground. Starry dark hovered over. And more or less with you, I stepped through the door into it. Another love poem, this one for my mother, um, whose birthday it would have been this month also. Once I was your other heartbeat, your deepest center. You were the world I was and knew. After all your life, I thought I was unlike you, the you I liked and otherwise. When you died, I began by missing you in space. Oh, how I longed to wake into your house to the soft of your pencil, crossing a page. To lie again on the flowered sheets of your bed, as we did near the end, watching reruns of Cheers. And your absence, in part, was this, what I'd expected, an absence outside that I knew I'd get used to. But in that afterlife, I began to sense your absence as presence, not some consoling idea of you vaguely around, but a presence, call it joy. I didn't name, but knew. A quickening, a pulse, as though something in me had loosened to let a subtle liquid through. It feels like my secret, but others see it too. A presence so close that even now I hear my laugh sometimes or stretch my legs just so and am confused and turn to find you. Don't, then do. From here, the poem moves, in, the uh, book moves into a section entitled Between that um, encounters and worries about, as you'll see, um, some of the direction of things in the world. Um, and so the title of this next poem, which is also the first line of the poem, we moved so fast through our last days in the Holocene, um, in case you don't know, I didn't, um, that the Holocene is our current geologic epoch, which began after the last ice age about 12,000 years ago, and is characterized by relatively stable warm temperatures. It's also known as the Anthropocene, the epoch of humans, which epoch may in fact be taking us out of the Holocene with the stability it involved. So we moved so fast through our last days in the Holocene. Our worry hurried us whether or not we knew. We tried to slow ourselves to break the spell of rush, but even that felt urgent in the imminence and so we hurried to how we tried to outrun our undoing, how trying hurried it along. So having introduced worry, I'm going to read a little poem um, to worry. One of the things um, that language does um, as was spoken about in the introduction is that it has the power to both divide us from things that um, in the process of naming we distance from something and as soon as we make it an object we have a very different relationship to it needless to say um, but it also has such a power to take us back in to a fuller connection um, but one of the the values i think of the ways in which sometimes it can distance 
is that, and this is one of the things I do sometimes with poems, is take an experience that I have that I feel way too identified with. It's, it's come to feel like me. And I think like a lot of people, anxiety can be that thing. Um, and to make it, uh, to put it at a distance is a way to be able to sort of take a more contemplative stance, to be able to observe something. Um, so I did that with the experience of worry itself. Um, and so this, this poem is entitled, The Worry. The worry hurried, it waxed and waned. The worry tasted like tinfoil, smelled like creosote and wet ashes, felt like a ball of steel wool. The worry wore a red chapeau atop its drab garb, whet its attention on CNN. Sometimes the worry wore itself out a while, then it fixed a Negroni and dish of nuts, lay on the chaise, listened to Eden Atwood singing, you leave me breathless. Why worry, the worry asked and answered. So finally from Send Word, um, I'm gonna read three pieces of what is this title poem and is also the last section of the book. Um, it's a nine part sequence that represents a series of, I guess sort of conversations, transmissions, I'm not really sure what to call them, but it was um, a, uh, an experience that I had, that's all I can say, um, during the course of uh, extended retreat. They just, these began and then they ended. And um, this sequence of poems is a kind of record of those. So I'm just going to read, they're each pretty short. I'm going to read, I think, uh, three, maybe four of them, probably three. Send words. So this is the uh, number one. I'll just identify them by number, but I'm going to skip through some of them. One. Then light began its slow blaze over the blue black hills, blazing the lake's dark muck. I expected a ruckus of geese, but one did not arrive. Nor did a wind stir the grasses to whisper, nor shiver the waters in mute delight. It was for me then to greet it, for me to rise to praise. Three, this was the thrill of the new, that I didn't have to decide or strive. Love is the original mission of language, I heard, that I could listen inside of it. So what of Love is the original mission of language. I knew it was true when I heard it, but I wanted more language to love it with, what I knew. Four. In the dream, mass was a mess. Children tore down the halls and aisles, and women crowded me in my pew, invasive with helpfulness. An old film stood in for the homily, while the priest in his chasuble messed with his phone. A choir stood holding guitars, but no music played. There was no space for it. Even the host was moldy in my mouth. I confess I spit it out. I stepped outside. Sunlight spilled over my feet like nard. In a wild gale stretched clouds into streamers and birds abandoned the trees. I grew restless in my solitude 
after the ecstasy of that long, still spell. Don't imagine it's left you, I heard this time. Your solitude swims in the churn of phenomena where stillness and restlessness rise and dissolve. But it's too noisy, my restlessness, to hear the song through the storm. You think the song's not in the storm? I'm going to read one more from Send Word and then um, I think because it's close to seven, I won't uh, read the, the new piece unless I get a signal otherwise. But um, I'm going to read a, a, a little bit lighter note, uh, Cento for September. And for those who, of you who don't know, uh, Cento form itself is all about uh, splitting and binding since a Cento is made. Uh, entirely from assembling lines from other poets' poems. It was used in ancient days as a tribute often to the poets involved. And this is a 16-line cento made of lines from 15 different poems by other poets. And if you have to get the book, all of the poets and their lines are named at the back, which is the right thing to do. <laughs> so, cento for September. I love this first, the first line of this poem. Dawn came with an element of Xanax. Moonlit clouds, the color of the desperation of wolves. And I can still see you where I have lost you here. The way gouged trees grow around wires, the self is a suffering form, it is. And prolonging everything, my lungs, this persistent heart, one way to live a life is to spend each moment asking the purpose of having a body at all, how your soul loves. I am done trying to make sense. Let's be giddy, maybe. Time lights a little fire. Orchids are gushing out from the faucets of my favorite chapel in the church of language. I am a faint light doused in the clamor. What eludes me has dearly become myself. And I have received the signal here that I can read this next poem, my new poem. So um, just a little bit of an introduction. It's a, um, this final and more recent poem is the result of a collaboration slash commission initiated by my friend and collaborator, uh, the composer Cassio Viana, um, who lives in the, and teaches in the Tacoma area. And the poem amounts to a kind of a seed piece for a larger uh, multimedia project that he envisioned, which would commemorate and celebrate the multiversity of the Pan-American experience, a Pan-America that includes immigrant, indigenous, enslaved, fugitive, and occupying peoples, and all the many languages, which are thought to be over a thousand, um, that people speak in all of those areas. So as an Anglo-American uh, myself, and from an historically dominant group, I felt especially important to me to find a way to include, without appropriating, the real polyphony of voices involved, find a way for the poem to speak from these without me speaking for them. So I came to the Cento form, and without further ado, I'll just say that the original is in, um, I believe, seven different languages. Um, and so I'm just going to read you the English language version. It's in three parts. Um, yes, so here goes. Part one, Otakaheya is Lakota, in the beginning. And the epigraph is, this was how I wanted to begin with the little I know. And that's from Lely Long Soldier's poem four. This is my homeland. Here I was born and here I live my dreams. I come from everywhere and to everywhere I go. I've come to shake hands with everyone in the world and the innocent earth without good or evil. I hear what went before, but which I don't yet touch. 
history has its eyes on us. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for they always light, however a light may come. Newborn out of sleep and forgetting, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it, you will dwell in me as in your kingdom, in an eternal arrival to the country of love. Next, uh, part two, and this, there are three, um, begins, its title is the last line of that poem. So, in an eternal arrival to the country of love, the epigraph, at dawn I rise and light my little fire, by Alba Eri Duarte, a Guarneri poet. We have just begun to touch the dazzling whirlwind of our anger. We belong to native nations of the North American landscapes. In what's called Latin America, we're more than half who dwell. We speak in the tongues of the occupiers and conquerors, but we also speak Diné, Inuktitut, and Arawak, Olelo, Hawaii, Quechua, Kawaskar. We speak in a thousand indigenous languages. 5.8 million alone of us speak Guarani. Write one more stanza now, set the page ablaze with the anger in the hollow ache of our bones. Air is between these words, fanning the flame, and we too want to sing. Three. And we too want to sing. The epigraph, the music helps me press play. Tracy M. Atsiti, Elegy for Yucca Fruit Woman. We sing our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, the sunlit sea song past of my parents' island, carrying withered memories that go whispering in verse and ballads, that which is not censored and never will be, that which does not make sense. Of torrents upon rock, the whispering, of the task of being, the bitterness. I want to enjoy the new flowered song, the sound that the stars make rushing through the sky. I want to take part in the new day and in the new dawn. For now, my wander song, the carol of robins perched on my pear tree. What if we joined our sorrows? I'm saying, I'm saying, what if that is joy? Thank you very much. That's great. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Thank you all so Thank much. You so Thank much. You that Thank was you, Shannon. Shannon, that was Shannon. That was beautiful. Um, so uh, we have Shannon muted, not because we don't enjoy her fantastic voice, but just to keep an echo down. So I will unmute you, Shannon, as often as I can. Just give me a little wave when you want to talk. So. It's a small, strange thing we have to do, but not because we don't love your readings. And in fact, we do have quite a few um, nice comments and uh, a question for, for you. And we have a lovely comment for you too, Donna. So I'll just read these and we can stop and hear what you have to say about them. So um, let's see. So Jason Umans, I might be getting that wrong. And if so, I apologize. Right, so hello, Shannon, Shannon. This is Jason. I'm loving your reading. Paul and Corey Gant told me about it. Can't wait to hear your book. That is just fantastic. Um, we also have from Karen McPherson. Fantastic reading, Shannon. Lyrical, vivid, evocative. What a story. I could listen to you forever. Mm. This book needs to be released as an audio book with you reading it. Thank you. And all these, by the way, you can read after a short pause. Uh, this uh, will be uploaded and you can read it yourself and, and watch it later too. So you don't have to absorb all these wonderful comments now. They will come up again later. So 
Um, Anita Sullivan also writes in response to Karen, yes, I agree. I was totally entranced at Shannon's voice and timing and with the words so carefully chosen. Wow. Henry Alley writes, thanks Shannon for the reading, which took me back to your novel, which I enjoyed. I know you have spent many years on Minus Tides. What were some of the things that took most of your time? So I will unmute you briefly. Let me mute the rest of us. Hold on just a moment. I think the struggle, it's not, thank you, Hank. Um, I think the structural aspects were an extraordinary struggle. And frankly, I'm still not sure I've got it right. But I have adopted uh, a, a uh, scheme uh, with many points of view or several points of view. And that's always dicey, you know, because this point of view thing, it's just like the author's trying to um, sort of fake a person out, right? Like it's just the author pumping through uh, for in the service of the story, right? Um, to inhabit a point of view that is very specific and uh, that has its own sort of breath is uh, not an easy thing. And to use it to build the story, this is, all takes place in 1973 and 1917. And it's a very, uh, the tide comes in, the tide goes out, you know. So I think that that was the biggest str struggle, the structural st struggle. And these people just spoke to me, they still do. I wish they'd <laughs> let me go on to my next book project, but um, it is extraordinary to, um, to, to just, as Hank certainly knows, and other people who write novels. Um, anyway, that's, I think, what I would say. Thank you so much for, for such an outstanding answer. Um, we still have more accolades, so hold on to your hats. Um, we have a lovely comment from Karen McPherson. Loved this, loving this reading, Donna, especially the love poem for your mother, the worry poem, the Holocene, a stunning poem from Eddie Fence. Favorite lines, I was your other heartbeat, our worry hurried us. Uh, Mary Gerard or Gerard says, thank you, Shannon and Donna. Ingrid Went says, what a treat to hear each of you tonight. The music of your prose, Shannon, is pure joy. And Donna, I wrote down so many memorable lines to savor again and again. Thank you. Thank you. And then added, and Shannon, that scene where the older woman falls and fades is marvelously realized. Uh -huh. So just fantastic comments. Um, all I have is gratitude and a great big thank you for your readings, for your passion. This was a, an outstanding event. So I'm, I'm not sure there's, I don't have any emails, which is not uncommon, um, but uh, lots of great comments. I'm not sure Diane and Amanda, if you have something more or wait, Shannon has something to say, hold the phone. Thing about Diane and Amanda because um, they really are such remarkable figures in this community. And I know a little bit and from Hank over the years, you know, that this is, a, this is a real thing to put on a series of readings like this and with such generosity and um, clarity. I mean, I, I'm a Luddite, you might've noticed, um, but uh, to be sort of gently guided through these, this different way of, of giving a reading, of presenting um, was lovely. And I just, I just adore them and I have so much respect for them and their work. Thank you. And Thank you so much. What, what loveliness. Yeah.
it's the community of writers and and literary art makers in the Eugene area and in Oregon yeah. that makes it really easy to do this. And, and on that on that note, we just want to say stay tuned for our next fabulous reading yeah. for next month and, and thank, the month after. And thank you both. It was just exquisite. And it just worked so beautifully together. It oh, just, it really did. It was yeah. really something. Absolutely. Um, and Karen McPherson did add that there's another another brilliant windfall. Thank you all, Shannon, Donna, Diane, Amanda, and Wendy. And Henry Alley writes, thank you both. Um, and just as a reminder, there's also, um, in addition to seeing you in a few weeks, this time next month, uh, there is a, a River Road reading also coming up. So don't forget about that one as well. So many good readings to choose from. It's so nice to have all these different options. So thank you all so much for being here. We'll see you next month. And um, in the meantime, stay safe and, and, and have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank, Thank you. you all.